This is SciBite, episode 91, for April 23rd, 2013. Welcome to SciBy, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live Tuesday evenings over at jblive.tv, and fresh Wednesday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. All right. What are we talking about today? Today, we're going to take a look at critiquing the Apollo 13 movie, training your brain, inspecting power lines. Spaceship 2, Solar Cells, Viewer Feedback, Curiosity News, and as always, take a peek back in history and up in the sky this week. That sounds like a blast. Let's kick it off with the news. All right, I got a little uh, preview before the show, so I already know, but tell the folks what's our first story this week. Apollo 13, the movie. Many people watched it. I watched it. Loved there it. Is, there is truth and there is... Not as much truth. <laughs> now, this isn't anything new specifically. I just sort of ran across a link to an interview with um, one of the members of the the team there. Sure. And so I got involved in it and I said, hmm, I look at the clock. This needs to go side bite. Let's just highlight the parts that I liked. I actually think this is a fantastic topic because, uh, first of all, I've, wa- I've seen now one problem is I've only seen the Apollo 13 movie probably 70 70- 80 times. So okay. I have this version of history very well memorized, but yes. I've always wondered if I maybe am missing some of the finer details. Now, maybe you'll fill some of that in for me. Yeah. Okay. Where so, do we start? So this is actually from an interview with uh, Thomas Mattingly, who was, if you've seen the movie, you know, there's measles outbreak and then mm-hmm. you know, somebody has to be pulled from the main squad. So, you know, he's kicked off the, uh, off the flight crew. So this is the interview with him. So, you know, it was, it really was like two weeks before the launch. Everyone got to go home, hang out with family. Another member of the backup crew went to a picnic where some kid had the measles, which meant it was like six degrees of separation of contamination. (laughs) And so they looked at his blood and he's like, calls home. He's like, mom, did I ever have the measles? No. It's one of those problems where times when you go, I didn't have the measles. No, because it means he couldn't go. Because then they think <laughs> he might he's have, susceptible he might get it. Yeah. and he might get it in flight. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily cool. So they're going back and forth with all the, uh, you know, the doctors and everything. And he's driving down the road, turns on his radio, and he hears a news report blast in saying that he'd been replaced. Wow, that's how he found out? That's what the that's interview said, that that's how he found out, that... There was a breaking news dun, 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 on the radio. Ouch. As he was driving. So. And that's not for, this isn't like some small time little project. This is going to no. the moon here. People or at least yes. they were supposed to, right? They were supposed to yes. land on the moon. Yeah, they were, you know, it was a moon, a lunar mission. But it kind of put him in a weird position. Um, that was kind of an interesting way to put it to see why his interview would be of interest. Because he wasn't part of the flight crew. Mm. So. Oh. He's back out, back on Earth, but he's not a member of the backup crew, and they have a specific job. Like his job was to be in space, and since he didn't have it there, all the other positions were filled. Right? Yeah, they don't nobody leave was, spots open just in yeah, case. Nobody yeah. was gonna like <laughs> kick him out. Yeah. So he definitely got to hang out in Mission Control, but he didn't have a specific job. So I never he thought kind about of, that. Yeah, he got, got, went kind of between the the teams and kind of helped out where he could, but not quite like the movie said so i mean you know it's like we have a problem it's like where how did they figure out what was going on you know so many thousands of miles away from earth when you can't call triple a triple nobody can go out and sort of kick the wheels to figure out what's going on they had no exterior view you know a lot of people may know that one like photo of the side of the once they've separated and it's all like there's a whole outside the barrier the, the walls kick, you know, crashed off and everything. But all they had was, you know, ideas that you have to assume hardware doesn't break. 
you know, the structures and the hardware has been tested and retested and the huge margins of, of safety. Assume that's okay and go for uh, software and, you know, instrumentation. Go beyond that. Mm. But uh, one of the flight directors, you know, they were all discussing what could have gone wrong and, you know, assuming, because you know, it is like alarms are going off and telling them something is wrong. They felt a, you know, an a explosion. Right. Yeah, they felt a jolt. And so everyone's like, well, instrumentation's doing funny things. And the flight director's like, um, didn't he say he looked out the window and said there was stuff there and that they heard something? That doesn't sound like instrumentation, does it? Oh, man. So. That sounds like a real problem. The uh, That's the, the uh, there's a famous line in the movie, of course, everybody in the chat room's been saying is, Houston, uh, uh, we have a problem. And it was actually, Houston, we had a problem. Oh, here's the uh, tank flip. And from the, so in the, okay, so according to the movie lore, uh, maybe you can tell, is this part accurate? They flip the tanks, or they rotate the tanks, they feel the jolt. Of course, the uh, recreation of the explosion is a bit of a recreation, I would assume. There. Yeah, yeah, a bit. But how, how, ac a how accurate do you suppose this is? Is this? What did you do? Nothing, I stirred the tanks. Um, Whoa. it is somewhat. Now there, when you see all the alarms going off in in the clip, and yeah, that was definitely kind of how it was going. But uh, yeah, that <laughs> I remember but, that moment in the movie too. Where it's like, oh, everything was going just fine until this point. <laughs> yeah, for had, shakes and air. Yeah, they had so, a little they had a little hiccup here and there, but nothing bad. Yeah. Now, one thing that I actually found interesting that was on the good side was they did some of the filming on the uh, what people call the vomit comet. Yeah. So they actually, you know, taking dives, they had a little bit of like a little shoot right there in there so that they could sort of things could float for the, you know, 30, you know, you have 45 seconds or whatever at a time that you're in weightlessness. And so they would like shoot things during that time. So you could actually like be floating around a little bit. Now that's an expensive movie production, I got to imagine. Like fuel costs there to keep that thing going, right? Because you get, yeah. it's the way it works is by going up and then going down and then by going up yep, and then by going down. down yeah so you gotta climb and climb and climb and then you fall then you climb and climb and climb and then you fall and they have they only can shoot while it's falling yeah no what you know you're saying um everyone you know has that line houston we had a problem mm -hmm. now one of the other ones if you look at the movie is failure is not an option never actually said oh that's a great the the uh, great it line where a, the the team's working together in the five hours that brings them to about there. Gentlemen, that's not acceptable. Gene, 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 you gotta talk about power. Whoa, whoa, guys. Power is everything. Power is everything. Are you telling me this conversation never happened? Without they don't talk to us. Similar problem. There's not a script that was not you know exactly like that. Right. There was a debate. There was it was actually the debate that was whether to turn around and come back or how to handle things was actually much bigger than the scene lets on. There was, you know, oh, yeah. one group that said, we don't know what's going on. We don't want to touch anything. We want to, you know, step back, chill, and uh, figure out what to do. The other group said, um, yeah, the picnic basket is slightly empty. We only got so much water. Um, we need to get back now. Mm. Now and yesterday. I love the, uh, the I love the scene. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. But it was, there was an actual interview with uh, the flight director, and then it was said, or the in, in the interview, it was just sort of a whole mentality. It was, you know, it's, we don't stop, we're not giving up, all we're doing is finding a solution. There is no mm. anything else. It is finding a solution. So it was, you know, assume you're going to succeed, don't do anything that gets in the way of that, and find a solution. So it was just the whole mentality. It wasn't necessarily that, right. that, that, you know, Fish shaking, glaring. Hollywood just had to summarize it and put it in a in a good two minute, three minute scene, and it yeah. was really a process. Yes. Yeah. So you're not gonna, you're not going to ruin my my Hollywood um, picture of how they solve the filter problem, though, right? Yes, I am. Oh, that's my favorite part, Heather. I know they had to put a square thing into a round hole or something like there, that, if I recall. That that is happened. That actually did. That's problem existed. Okay. 
But you know, like in the movie, you're the backup guy, you know, this doing this interview, he's like hopping in the simulator and working oh, out yeah. stuff. No. Yeah, yeah. Nope, nope, nope. That never happened? Nope. That he... seemed like the most obvious thing out of all of them that happened. Well, what actually was there is they have those simulators. They do them, they do them in prep for all of these things. Now, what they they had one that they called LM Lifeboat, and they said, okay, let's assume that the atmosphere in there is contaminated. You guys have all this. Now figure out how to do it. You know, figure out how to go into this section and make it work. So they had had a sim where they made the square peg fit in the round hole. Okay. They made a sim. You know, they have, uh, you know, they're looking at the, out the window trying to make that course correction yeah. to get back to Earth. And right. It, it had to be very, very, very precise. Now, not as precise as they say, actually. But they had prepped that in the simulation. They had practiced that kind of a thing. Sure. They had, you know, so they knew exactly how close they had to make it. They knew, you know, what happened if you're drifting slightly and you need to correct yourself. All these type of things were already prepped. All they had to do was find the people who did it. Was it the square peg in the round hole? Um, it had led by a certain team member. I don't recall his name. And so they literally just like, Hey, do you remember? I think we did that. Hey, call him up. So call him up and they write out all these instructions. And then like they go through and they talk to uh, the backup career. They say, you know, they call out everything and see what they say. Or they, you know, let them read down the line and make sure that it could, it makes sense being communicated like that. And they mark it up. Say, okay, well, this needs to be changed. This needs to be changed. This needs to be changed. Okay, this is what happens. It was pen and paper and brains. It wasn't you know, going into the simulator and somebody's in the other room scribbling and yeah. he's there trying to figure everything out. And they'd done these things where it was um, not necessarily as much or all in the same configuration, but they were looking at, you know, how to run on, you know, certain amperages. Now that it wasn't him, anybody sitting in there turning things on and off in the right order. It was them with pen and or pencil and paper and calculations saying, okay, this has to be done in this fashion in order for it to be able to launch or able to, you know, turn everything back on. Hmm. And there is... Um, I like it better. I like the movie version better, just to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like I like them in there stuck in the, in the simulator and they're trying different stuff. Yeah. That was very dramatic, Heather. Yeah, well, it's kind of sad, but looking back on mm. it... Mm-hmm. There was some Monday morning quarterbacking that there was a problem with that oxygen tank before the launch. I was wondering if they had any kind of suspicions like that. So they did have suspicions. They did. Um, They'd seen problems like like it before where it was the two oxygen tanks and they could, you know, um, empty them out all the way. And one would be all the way empty and the other one only got to like 85% or something and it just wouldn't vent anymore. So what they did is they, you know, heated it up, boiled the oxygen out when the drain system wasn't working really good. But, and so they, you know, they saw that happen right before the launch, but they didn't want to, they felt a lot of pressure and they didn't want to stop for anything. It was run. And as you trip, roll and keep running. So it was, they were under a little, they were letting themselves be under a little bit of uh, too much pressure to move forward, no matter what. That's interesting because it always seems like, you know, you hear about uh, um, these, these launches getting scrapped for anything almost. Well, Part of that was from that. I mean, in this case, it was, okay, we'll just boil it off. So they left it on to boil it all off, except it was eight hours of 65-volt power. And that component, those you know, those components, the hardware, was not really meant to take that much heat. Mm. So it was probably not, it wasn't really rated for that. So it probably would have caused severe damage to the heating elements of the tank. And... So that was that specific oxygen tank. And then they can kind of get an idea of, okay, well, if that happened, then it probably shot off a piece here and damaged the other tank. But after they came back, part of the sort of, you know, they'll have these investigation reviews. Mm -hmm. And pretty much what they said is, all right, you know what? We let ourselves feel like we were being rushed. Like you couldn't, you know, stop. You couldn't do anything. You had to keep rolling and we had to do it on a date. And that's it. Guess what, guys? That's over. We don't do anything. You stop and you check. If anyone seems anything possibly wrong, everything stops. 
That's it. I guess lesson learned. It and, takes and, taxis. And nobody had to die. Yeah. Now, the whole idea of, you know, they were switching things back on. Now, one of them was the uh, inertial unit. It lets them hold, lets them know where they were in the universe, altitude, stars, planets. Now, these things are really, really delicate. And they would, like, keep them at near 70 degrees, like plus or minus one degree right. Fahrenheit. Right. And they tested them at, like, only plus or minus 10 degrees. Now, when everything turned off and they were turning things back on, they weren't quite sure what the temperature was. Yeah. But pretty sure it was below freezing. Yeah. So they were trying to figure out whether these things actually worked or not. And so they're talking about it. And suddenly when life, things are life or death for a situation, you kind of, you get over your fear of telling the boss something you did accidentally one weekend. Right. So there was one of the guys from uh, one of the employees. This is sort of a, a quote unquote story that may probably be true. But the story goes that one of the employees had actually accidentally left one of those like in the back of a station wagon during, you know, like winter break. And there'd been a snowstorm mm. and, like dur- over the weekend. And when he got back, he saw that it was in there and he's like, oh, darn. So brings it inside and tests it and it works. So he never said anything. Oh, good. <laughs> so you until keep- <laughs> then, until then, somebody was like, <laughs> um, actually. Should be okay. If, as long as I'm not fired, hand raise in air, I think I have an idea that it should be okay. That is funny. Well, that's that's the kind of on the ground testing you need. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had, you know, I've done, my company has done some uh, small business contract work for NASA. And they had, you know, some review people that like, came by once and saying, you know, everyone's important, you know, thumb up, big smile, shine off tooth, and uh, telling these stories. And one of them was, that during one of the shuttle missions, you know, there was an older gentleman. It was, you know, he was doing his last training session for the next guy. He was about to retire and went to plug in a cable and just didn't feel right. He's like, huh, plug, unplug. Doesn't feel quite right. So he stops everything because he says, nope, I, it's my last day. I can't sign off on this, though. Hmm. So everything got us to a halt because of that. Now, what happened was that the plug itself there was uh, some connections that weren't there. So they backtrack it into this uh, shop, essentially, that is, you know, spitting out these components. They're like, you know, big discs with so many holes in them. And so they're looking through the shop and everything looks fine and dandy. And one of the interns is kind of hanging back and he peers down and he actually sees in a trash can some things that look like these parts, except not all the holes are, are punched out. Hmm. And it was all through hydraulics. And every once in a while, all the machines or so many of the machines would all go at once. And it would lose pressure enough so that not everything got fully punched in. Right. (laughs) And they just didn't think anything of it. And so somewhere along the line, it meandered its way to this, you know, launch. And, you know, the person telling the story was like, and it could have had very bad effects on the launch. You know, indicating that something not happy may have happened. But mm-hmm. it's that sort of whole thing where it's now you see, you know, they scrub for everything, but it's they kind of swung wildly in the other direction once they figured out that they'd kind of let themselves be pushed too far. Feel like yeah. they were under the gun. Yeah. And that's too much hard under the gun, you, letting people yep. letting other people tell you what to do. Yep. Now, in some cases, there's nothing you can do about that. But with safety, they just kind of had to really Get it up and say, all right, push back on that a little bit. Be like, no, pressure, yes. Life, yes. Both need to exist. As I put my hands out trying to hold an invisible barrier out. <laughs> so it's <clears throat> in some of the ways it was, it was kind of cool. You know, that I love that scene where they just dump these things out onto the table and go, yeah. all right, we want this into Solve that. It. Yeah. Go. That's awesome. Now, it sort of happened, but not during the mission. It happened during a previous mission. So all they had to do for these things was call the right people up and, you know, get all the instructions written out. So, Makes me want to go I'll, watch the movie, though, even though it's not, uh, it, I'd say it's inspired from from history. Yeah. Most of these are, you know, loosely inspired based on a, this one, I mean, a lot of, I mean, the basic facts were there. Yeah. Just, 
not necessarily as movie exciting as as you might think because guess what not all things are are, are as movies tell us it's mean that's true maybe 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 one day uh that won't be the case but as of at least right now Heather, that does seem to be true yes any other thoughts on that one no it's just it was interesting fine so yeah thanks for sharing that that's that was really as soon as I saw that in the show, I was like, oh, can't wait to talk about that. Something else that I can't wait to talk about. I saw some stills over a track movie, and it looks amazing. Of course, you guys know that we like to have some picks in this episode. When you grab these picks, when they're linked in the show notes, if you click the link in the show notes, then we get a little bit of, of credit for the purchase. And uh, this week, Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3 Blu-ray. Okay. All right. So I saw I saw the pictures for this thing. I you did. I, I can't believe how good it looks. I cannot believe how oh, good it looks. Oh, I can't wait to get it. Everything looks good. Like, and one of the things that's really interesting is you realize how uh, how good like some of the props. I'm gonna be honest with you. Like some of the plants, they don't look so uh. good. They look a little. They look a little 80s plasticky. But wow. like the clothing and the makeup and all that stuff, amazing. How they they must have spent time and effort on it. Now, of course, season three is really when the next generation sort of got into the right gear. It's, oh, yeah. it's a fantastic season alone. But if you want the highlight, also we'll have linked in the show notes, Star Trek's uh, The Next Generation Season 3, Best of Both Worlds, um, which is yes. going to be epic on Blu-ray. I cannot oh, believe yeah. how good the show looks on Blu-ray. I mean, I just... Oh, I know. Uh, so anyways, we'll have links to those. If you grab those... From the links, then uh, you'll you'll give we'll give we'll get credit. Jupiter Broadcasting gets credit. And by the way, if you go to JupiterBroadcasting.com and you scroll all the way down to that, well, get to the bottom of that website. Go all the way down there. We got links down there for Amazon, US, Netflix, eBay, Newegg, Think Geek, Best Buy, Audible, which is awesome, yes. and uh, also uh, browser extensions. You just install those in your browser; it automatically tags your shopping session for you for those sites and even other sites. And we appreciate everybody that supports the network by doing that. And uh, I'll. Uh, Let's see. Um, I will have I will have gotten the Blu-rays. I will have gotten the season three Blu-rays right probably before we go on air oh, next no. week because it's I believe it's Tuesday that uh, oh. that the pre-order ship and so when the way when Amazon does it they actually like will ship them that day so yeah I'll have them here in my ha- little hands and I'll tell you all about at least the the box I suppose <laughs> yeah well see my theory is that uh, Chris will be quiet next next time by <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that just... some of the things will be changed really slowly <laughs> it's because he's actually watching the show yeah like, usually we'll hear be like oh no look out and we're like. Yes, look out, science. And instead of uh, uh, instead of a uh, instead of a, like a, the right uh, theme for like the news, you'll hear computer. What happened? And uh, unable to comply. <laughs> yep. Internal scanner readings have been the, damaged. Like, no. I'll get my wires crossed a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> All right, Heather. Well, uh, while we still are, are on the tracks for this episode, what do you say we move on to the news bite? <laughs> All right, I believe you're going to tell me how to train my brain. I may indeed. Okay. So using some sea snail nerves, and I'm trying to say that correct, nerve cells, they've actually reversed memory loss by determining when the cells were like primed for learning. Oh, really? So they're hoping to be able to compensate for memory loss by retraining using, you know, optimized training schedules. You know, I've done the classes, you know, in in high school and college and everything. You're like, man... This time of the day is like my time of the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, those totally. classes are right. Yep. You're like, try to schedule the good stuff for that little time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's those games on, online or on handheld or anything where it's like, train your brain. You know, and it's there's some of them that go, try it out at different times of the day. Figure out when you're at your best. I remember like the Nintendo DS had a big one for a while. Um, yep. There's some on the smartphones for sure. So these things actually work? Yes, actually. It's, um well... Specifically to time of day. Now they've actually they're sort of built on a huh. story um, from 2012 that said, you know, memory enhanced strategies can increase like long term memory. So they're able to to develop some really crazy mathematical models hmm. that could actually sort of predict when those processes, when the uh, when the biochemical processes of the snail's brain were like primed for learning. So they took like five different training sessions during different times of the day, you know, ranging between a short five minute and long 50 minutes. They had, they shoved it all through this model, could spit out like 10,000 different schedules. And from that, it would be able to pick out the ones that said, yep, 
this one and that one and this one. These are probably the best. And so they sort of, to mimic them, they kind of gave the these like a uh, chemical at specific intervals based upon these models. Hmm. And after like five training sessions where, you know, at irregular intervals, the strength of the connection sort of returned to near normal in the impaired cells. Oh. That sort of bounced back. So they might, th- they think that it may actually apply to humans as well if they could figure out the same, if the same process works. Right. But if you really feel that is, you know, you can do these different little things or find out for your own that says these times during the day are my best, then maybe you do. You know, I mean, I know for me personally, just through my own observation, I definitely have a very strong core uh, proficiency time between about 10.45 and 11 o'clock every day. That's really when I'm at my best. (laughs) That's that's your best time. Get a cram as much as you can in those 15 minutes. Right, yeah. Let's see. 15 minutes. It's a ramp up and it's a ramp down after that. Out of an hour, <laughs> out of out of a day. So let's see, what percentage of the day is Chris really useful? <laughs> really and, italics useful. And I think it starts to slip uh, like the later the day goes. Now, the, I tell you, the, the sun being out, I think, has helped. The, the later sun, yeah. I, I feel like that's helped with the energy level a little bit. Yeah. But I could so, see this. I could like I could see it yeah. during like when I was in school, especially in my later classes, uh, like I, uh, I as a senior and as a, I think maybe even as a junior, I was clever enough to put like my art classes in the in the afternoon when I was getting mm-hmm. tired after lunch, yeah. food coma. <laughs> yeah, but so, I mean, you can do these things and kind of figure out what your time of the day and just use it that you know for yourself. But they've also looking at it for um, using it in combination with like traditional drug treatments for memory problems. Say, so, all right, well, how could it help? That, you know, maybe, um, you know, specific type of, you know, treatment regimen from uh, prescription or and or this, you know, training methodology. Mm. So they're hoping, you know, to help individuals with various learning or memory deficits to kind of use all of this towards that. That would be good, too. Absolutely. I want I'll wait for it. I can wait. Let let them all the medical stuff can get that figured out for them. And then when it's ready for the consumers and there's an app for that, I'll be standing by. And I'll just put my finger in the machine a couple times a day. It'll take some measurements, run 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 a few math, math, math mathematical tests on the screen. I answer them, and then mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it says, "All right, your most productive time was during this time." And then it just charts it for me, and then it gives I, me I, a report. Yeah, I think the 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 way that we're trying to take this is yes, you'll learn that, but the point being that those times is when your brain is like the most spongy. Right. So you could start if you Absorbing. train it during that time, then your whole brain might start to get a little bit stronger, to so say. Very interesting. I like that. All right. Well, should we move on to the two bite? Nope. The two bite news. Uh, see you later, guys. Thank you for joining us. I got it from here. All right. The band's yeah, heading down, Heather. Yeah, you, you almost like pushed them out the door before they got here. Well, I got to tell you, they showed up a little underprepared. Oh. Yeah, they didn't bring the uh, string section, and I had to have Angela bring something down from the attic. Not very impressed. Oh. oh. So, uh, power lines. Yes. So, you have the power lines, that, you know, swing all the, up and down the road. Now, they have to go through, and they have to sort of inspect those. So now they have these utility companies have these big, you know, manned or unmanned you know, helicopters and equipment with infrared imaging to inspect lines. And they have robots that are really large and complex and mm. expensive. Mm-hmm. So some mechanical engineers uh, at University of California, so college kids, and again, invented a robot designed to kind of scoot along those lines and search for damage or yes, problems. Yes, yes. They made it all with off-the-shelf electronics and plastic parts. Oh, awesome. And then they printed some of it out in a uh, 3D printer. Oh, when? Yes. So the Sky Sweeper. <laughs> I, I say dramatically and wave my arms in the air. Nice. <laughs> but it could be scaled up, they say, for like less than $1,000. So much more economical than anything that they're using right now. Yeah. Sort of. Then they say, hey, if you're actually using, because you can do it on uh, telephone lines or anything, other, you know, lines. But if you use it Mm. on power, they said, hey, you could actually put induction coils into that and sort of 
suck off some of the energy in the power line and right, right. go forever, pretty much. And it could just go around doing like little repairs, checking for well, it's, breaks. It's not doing repairs; it's just checking for breaks. Well, or obviously, this damages one. in the line. I was talking like you know in the future, but yeah, I mean they could yeah. have a little camera on this thing, and it could go around and say, "Hey, we detected a crack," or "Hey, you wanted to see the spot in the line." See, yeah. what's interesting is uh, in in shows here on the network when I've mentioned, "Oh, power's." going out, blah, 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 something like that. A lot of times I'll get emails from people out of out of the country that say, you silly Americans, why don't you just bury your power lines like all of us civilized countries do? But look at this, huh? Where Where's your power line robots, you buried power line people? <laughs> You know, this oh. is, I do like that, though. We've kind of like, we're like, well, look, it's gonna it would be a massive investment to bury these things. But Boy. we could put robots on the lines. <laughs> yeah. And- and they even said like, hey, by doing it, you can see it um, if you look at the video where it's just kind of back and forth, you know, grip the almost like hand over hand yeah, sort of. Yeah, it's awesome. Except just, just kind of scooting along the line. Now, what they think is if they can strengthen the clamp, then maybe they could release one side of it and it would swing or all the way around to kind of get past uh, cable support points. Hmm. Oh, sure. Since it's, since it's essentially like you're... In like game style, scooting along the edge of a cliff, trying to get to another, you know, another part of the game. But they could actually swing to get past those points. There is a whole series of drone type gear that we haven't thought of. Stuff in the water, stuff on power lines. I mean, all kinds of just drony type devices as the tech. I mean, look what those guys are using. Mm-hmm. If that makes it accessible. It's pretty fascinating yeah. to see what's coming down the pipe. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, uh, before we get out of the uh, two-byte news, I believe uh, that we have a little Virgin Galactic news. We do. They've had the suborbital spaceship, too. These are not the guys that are getting, um, you know, we see SpaceX a lot going mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. delivering, you know, uh, stuff to the space station. This is Virgin Galactic. This is them going, hey, want to buy a seat in a plane that goes to space? Yes. Big thumbs up. Shiny po- to shiny poster on wall. So they've actually done their first what they call cold flow flight. Uh, so they actually ran oxidizer through the propulsion system out the back of the nozzle of the ship. Now they were, didn't actually turn the rocket engines on, but it's oh. kind of that's the next big step. So they're kind of taking these in step one at a time. They've had the rockets on, just not necessarily in the air. You can see a uh, video in the show notes. We may have seen, you know, well, what do you mean they haven't shown it? The guy flew up there. That was yeah. on quote unquote, Spaceship One. Oh. It was for the one guy. This is Spaceship Two. This is the one that has, you know, how many seats that they're mm-hmm. for the mere cost of $200,000. Well, if you're Hollywood, you that might be can a deal. Buy a seat on board. Maybe the next Apollo 13 remake will be shot up there. <laughs> yeah. Now, they, even before like anyone knows when it might actually go up, they already have like, 550 people that have put down deposits. <laughs> I love it. So it's this thing where, you know, they'll, they want to sell flights to people. And if I, you know, if I had that kind of money to say, yeah, mm-hmm. I'd be like, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe. Yes. If I had, yes, I would too. If I had money, like if I had that money to spare and it wasn't going to hurt nothing. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd be on that. That'd be great. That'd be a great episode of Sci-Fi when I came back and tell, told everybody all about it. And you came back. Well, us, because if I had that kind of money, I'd send, I'd send everybody. It'd be like, it'd be like, all right, with all, everybody's going. <clears throat> Every, everybody. Everybody's show will be from space this week, and they're all going to be three minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone needs to donate. Yeah, no for kidding. For every <laughs> second that you watch. Yeah, that'll watch be a pay-per-view. one second of the show, guess what? <laughs> a pay-per-view event for the internet. Yes. Um, once we're up there, we might need some solar cells. We might indeed. They have actually have... Uh, so silicon cellular cells can never really generate more than one electron from one proton, sure. which there's a lot of conversion efficiency limitations, but they've, and they've been working for decades on how to get around some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if in a solar cell, if a photon comes in, it doesn't have quite enough energy, then the cell won't absorb it. If it has too much energy, then there's waste heat and you kind of lose some of what you what you could have had. So now what they're able to do is through this organic dye they call pentacene. They're actually able to have a cell based on that that could generate two electrons from a single photon. So getting more electricity huh. out of the same amount of sun. Yeah. 
So what it is is an, an arriving photon generates two excitations or excited states hmm. that from uh, from hitting it, which actually lets them yield two electrons out of it. They've used similar tricks using like quantum dots, which are like tiny, tiny pieces of matter that behave like atoms and with using deep ultraviolet light. Hmm. But instead, wow. they're able to use this specific dye. Now, they're not really sure why it works. As of right now, it works. Hmm. Happy face, thumbs up. Hmm. And it only works specifically with a kind of narrow band of visible light. But they're kind of look, backtracking and looking into, you know, what what is going into it and how they can use it. And could we possibly coat sol- uh, silicon solar cells with this to kind of boost conversion rates? Right. They say they could uh, have uh, conversion efficiency from 25% to, you know, over 30%. Uh, so, you know, fi- another 5 maybe 10%. I can't wait till uh, <clears throat> I can't wait till they get it down to a price point that they can, you know, sell them to people like me. Because I've looked at uh, I, a long time ago. I had this. I, I okay. I should back up. I worked for a company that was producing solar panels, and so mm-hmm. I was able to get them at a considerable discount. But it still wasn't really within my grasp. But I thought it'd be so cool to all the equipment from the studio would be powered by solar, and I, yeah. I could actually almost get there if I did like if I had the right setup. But it would just be so expensive. Yeah. Well, any, you know, if they make them more efficient, that means less panels that people need to buy. So maybe uh, maybe we're getting closer and closer. All right, Heather, yeah. look out. Stand back. Don't be alarmed, but there's a red flashing light on the Cybite 2000. I'm going to press it, and okay. who knows what'll happen. Oh, we have some incoming communications. Excellent. It was not a problem. Oh, good, good. See, it was either that or the self-destruct. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah that, that was bad. That was sh- bad. You know what? Scientists in the future should label these things. Very much so. <laughs> All right, who do we get an email from? All right, actually, this week it comes from my hubby. Oh. Even <laughs> everybody can can check, say, "Hey, check the story out," and he's very excited. That's the direct this line. Is, this is very direct. You know, pretty certain that I'm not going to miss that email. Um, so, Tetris to treat lazy eye. Yes. Hmm. So there's a research team has figured out this kind of innovative approach to be able to treat adults um, with lazy eye. It's called a ambliopia. And from Ooh. now on, I'm not going to kill that word <laughs> okay. any longer, and I'm going to call it lazy eye. Nice. <laughs> so it is the most common cause of visual impairments in childhood, and it really comes from the poor post-processing in the brain. It sort of results in the brain sort of suppressing the signals from one eye. So it means you have a weak eye that's not really being useful. So, but I mean, it's like 3% of the population. And you really treat it, I mean, the whole, you know, patch over one eye, you know, it's pretty much the common treatment now for the stronger cases of it, but it only works in children. It's really oh. less than slightly useful in adults. Oh. So, what they're trying to do is figure out a way to make, you know, it's all about, about making your two eyes cooperate together to do something. Now, even as an adult, your brain has some sort of plasticity to it, which, you know, you can space it for treating a range of conditions where, um, you know, vision has been lost as some sort of result of, you know, early visual de- uh, development in childhood or all these type of different things. What they're able to do is they took this head mounted video goggles. They're able to display the game when, where, so that each eye saw something different. Only one eye was allowed to see the falling objects, and they sort of lined it up, I imagine. And the other eye was allowed to see where the ground was. So you're seeing, like, the little, the horrible little squiggled um, bricks falling down, trying to figure out where in the world it's going to go. And you have to use your other eye to look at Mm. the ground to figure out where you can put it. So by distributing the eyes, the information between the two eyes, they're actually making the brain use both eyes work together. So it's sort of giving, uh, sort of making that weak eye work. So they had 18 adults with this. Nine played the game where they they only displayed the whole thing to the weak eye. 
So it was essentially like patching the good eye. Mm -hmm. So they showed everything on the weak eye. And then for the other half, they had it split, you know, where they actually have, you know, each eye seeing something different. And only after two weeks, there was a dramatic improvement in the vision of the weaker eye and in 3D depth perception. And oh, well over the, you know, there wasn't a lot of change for the people who only saw the monocular, the, the lazy eye only. They only showed very moderate improvement. But once they switched to them to the uh, to the two eye system, then their vision also improved dramatically. So it's probably a really. <laughs> I was like, that's the Tetris theme, Heather. It is. I know. And I was, I was having flashbacks. I was like <laughs> looking at my show notes, and I was trying to like, like where's that coming figure from? Figure out how yeah. to shuffle them so that they all line in lines and move this word down. There you go. You're playing Tetris. <laughs> yes. I'm playing Tetris with the words in my show notes, and I thought maybe it was just in my head. No, I, I was helping uh, Bryant in the chat room. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, this is one of the advantages if you join us live, folks, over at jblive.tv Tuesday at 7.30 p.m., which is about 10.30 p.m. Eastern over at jblive.tv. You get to hang out with us in the chat room, and then we'll troll you. <laughs> yes. And something you say may actually be, you know, useful Maybe. or I may respond to it or derail you may the show. not only get trolled right but of course you don't have to join us live to send feedback to the show either you can always email the show scibite at jupiterbroadcasting.com or hit the contact link at the very top of our website and then choose scibite in the drop down or even better because it's nice and short just tweet heather at jb underscore mars underscore base that is me any other uh, thoughts on that one no they're just uh looking at this as real treatment regimen because Kids could use this and they would like it. And it's not a bad form of medicine either, as far, yes. as, as, far as treatments go. That's not too yeah, bad. Yeah, you're like, time for your vision treatment. Yay! And then it's time over. You're like, no, really? <laughs> no. Really, we need the Tetris vi- goggles back. Like, Mom, five more minutes. Well, and once you get that uh, vision problem sorted out, uh, what do you say uh, you uh, use that clear vision to look at data from Mars? Let's go do a curiosity update. Are you ready? Go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Nothing. Uh, all right, Heather. So what's, uh, <laughs> what's what's curiosity up to? All righty. Well, as we may know, I may have mentioned it a few times in the last couple of side bites. Right now, we are in conjunction, which means that the sun is sitting pretty much directly in between Mars and Earth, which means there's not a lot. We're not telling the rover or either Curiosity or even the Orbiter or even poor little Opportunity that keeps chugging along that we're not telling them to do anything. They all had um, to-do lists Mm -hmm. that we sent before the conjunction started. Mm -hmm. So right now they're just kind of doing their data. They're sending some back. They are taking some basic data and then they're sending some of it to us. They'll send us copies once everything's done to make sure that we actually got a good version of it. Yeah, a good version of all the data. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we're kind of looking through what we've already seen. And we know the, you know, it has the lasers (laughs) because nobody can read that this thing landed with a jet back and it has a laser. Right. Got to remember that. Yes. Very important parts. So then they were, you know, they drilled the hole. They were able to laser. They lasered the surface of the rock around the hole. So, Hmm. And then they actually look, they were able to see inside the drilled hole. So they had the dirt or the dust from the drilled sack. And then they were able to kind of peer into it and laser down the side of the hole. So they could get very accurate representation of what the chemicals were at very specific depths. And so, I mean, it fired, you know, 150 times, five bursts of, you know, 30 shots a piece. All at very specific points. So they were able to do it with really, obviously they'd have to do it with really good accuracy in order to get the composition of the wall and to have all of those, you know, shots all in the same point so that you could actually get enough heat to vaporize a little bit of it so they could actually use the Kim Cam hmm. to analyze the, you know, the chemistry makeup, the spectrographic analysis of the, you know, the vaporized stuff. Right. So then they're able to actually also use a micro-imager to sort of capture images of those laser pits 
and look at the uh, small craters of, you know, loose tailings and tiny scraps of the hard surface and the wall, hole, the holes in the wall. So they took like, they did the laser and they took the analysis from that and they took the, you know, micro imager, the really good, you know, look at it, look at the small stuff camera and sort of reach over and analyze the holes that they lasered there as well. So they could get a very good idea of what it looked like and what the kind of data they got from it. Hmm. Well, that sounds like fun up on Mars, digging holes and then poking it with lasers. <laughs> it wouldn't be too bad. I could do yeah, that. You know. I, could, I could do that job. They don't have to send a robot. They could just send me. Yeah, I I'd, I'd totally, totally could do that. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, Heather will have links to that. In fact, Heather has links to everything she talks about in the show notes. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and find episode 91. And uh, she got uh, she got even more information in there. All right, Heather, you ready to jump in the time machine? I think so. All right, close the door, close the door. Oh, wait, oh, almost. I don't know why sometimes I almost forget. I got to get a, like a, a better latch on that door. Okay. I mean, one of these days we're going to get sucked into the uh, time ether. So this trip takes us to 117 years ago. That would be April 28th, 1896. What happened this week in science, Heather? The first manual parachute jump. <laughs> oh, that must have been... Wow, could you imagine the risk there? <laughs> yeah, so it was the first jump with the Army manually operated parachute. Now, it was the, from Leslie Leroy Irvin. He actually, you know, made it. So he was sort of relying upon himself not to mess everything up at, you know, over 1,000 feet in the air. So he had this, what he called a free parachute, which is the operator, you know, jumps before you actually pull the ripcord. Because in the army and previously, they sort of, everyone lined up and you, the parachute was already out. Or it oh. got pulled as you jumped out. Uh, and Rock, so Rock, this, one... know, this is the first ever, not necessarily first successful. So this one, they so this one was different in the sense that it was completely folded away. So they had to come up with a yeah. folding system and a release system and all of that. Yes. So they you know, he jumps out of the uh, the biplane, going you know 100 miles an hour, over about 1500 feet. He pulls the cord and parachute deploys, and everything's happy. <laughs> he kind of broke his ankle when he landed. Oh, ouch. That must have been a hard but, landing. Yeah, that probably wasn't pleasant. Actually, it was funny. He actually went on to found the Irving Air Chute Company, <laughs> which um, if you check the show notes, it's spelled C-H-U-T-E. And that's because somebody actually misspelled it. We, on like the, the actual like business documentation. You're kidding. Somebody misspelled it. And then they just kept it because it ended up being sort of a... Uh, unique or whatever. Yeah, unique. Yeah. And they <clears> actually <throat> went on... To make, uh, they're now Irving Aerospace. Right. So, and they've actually gone through and they do a lot of different um, things that are very interesting nowadays. I don't recall off the top of my head everything they do, but. They have a big congratulations to SpaceX on their uh, on their front page, though. Yes. So that's cool. And they're working with NASA. Look at yep. them go. I mean, that, gosh, that is some bravery. There's no yeah. bravery like being the first guy to jump out of, a, of an airplane with a backpack uh, backpack version of a of a parachute. <laughs> That's, yeah, no way I'd be that well, I mean, guy. If, well, yeah, it will, it will make sense. They probably made a lot of parachutes. I mean, for landing the stuff, the mm -hmm. technology they made could have gone into, or they may have built. You know, the parachutes from where you know SpaceX is landing, and all these other types of. Um, anything that's coming down really that needs a parachute, they may have had something to do with the technology involved. Absolutely. All right, Heather, stand by. I'm going to recalibrate the side by two thousand so we can look. <laughs> Up into the sky this week. Let's go. On Wednesday, April the 23rd, the, if you will look to the southeast, the blue giant star Spica is going to be near the almost full moon. Mm. And it actually, it's parts of South Africa and Central and South America. For our viewers who are there, it will actually pass uh, a cult or pass right in front of Spica. So you'll be able to actually see that blink out, as you might say. And on Thursday, April the 25th, um, there's going to be a slight lunar eclipse for um, some of our viewers in the European persuasion, I believe. Nice. 
And there's uh, links in the show notes for exact times of when that might start for you okay. with UTC time and all that kind of stuff. I'm not even going to pretend to translate horrible time frames of reference nine mm. hours different from me and mm. really mess you up. <laughs> Just go look at the show notes. That way you don't yeah. get the wrong thing stuck in there. <laughs> yes. And that will actually tell you exactly you know, what time zone you're in equals what time zone you want to look. Hold on. That's no moon, Heather. <laughs> that's that's a slightly uh, lunar eclipsed moon. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. All right. All right. Also on Thursday, uh, now the star, quote unquote, you're going to see near the um, moon is actually going to be Saturn. And on Friday, the moon rises right above Saturn, actually. Moving into Saturday morning, should you be awake early on Saturday morning, look to the southwest and there'll be the red supergiant star and Teres below the moon. So we got a lot of different stars and planets hanging about the moon this week. Yeah. And Saturday, actually, a uh, very interest of uh, will be that Saturn is at opposition, which means that the Earth is directly in between the sun and Saturn. Hmm. And No more talking can... to Saturn. No, no, it's it's on our side. Oh, oh, okay, good. So we can now we can finally catch up. Yep. Hold your <laughs> think of it. Hold your fist out. Your fist is the sun. Okay. Your, you know, not exactly to proportion, but your okay. elbow is Earth and your shoulder is the uh, Saturn. Oh, so it's a straight line. Okay. Oh wow. And okay. Cool. So it's a straight line, but because of how it is, because essentially we're facing straight away from the sun and looking into our own shadow, as it might say. There is this phenomenon that they call the Selinger or opposition surge, hmm. which means that for the couple of days around Saturn, um, around Saturday, that if you look at Saturn's rings, they will actually appear brighter. Oh, cool! They kind of get lit up. Yeah, it's just the the way it works. It's you may have seen uh, there's various things that have example for the the. Uh, some of the Apollo pictures where they couldn't really face the camera towards the sun because uh -huh. it's very not productive mm -hmm. towards camera equipment. So they face away from it. And if you face away from took this picture, then the things right around the astronaut's shadow, right in the middle, seem brighter than other things. And that's part of this effect. It's not just a matter of the, the center of the image was, you know, the film was better or worse or whatever it is. It's that that is this effect going on. Mm -hmm. So we've got Saturn, our little shining star of ringness, mm. coming out, you know, in the south to southeast around in twilight this week. Will be its highest point in the south around 1 a.m. daylight savings local. And then so kind of keep a watch for out for that. Otherwise, we've got Jupiter hanging out after sunset in the west. It'll actually be the first quote-unquote star to appear over there and it'll be sitting as it has generally these past long while sitting below the orange super giant Aldebaran. Okay. So Mars isn't actually hanging out over there with Jupiter. Not in the sky at least. It's the orange super giant star Aldebaran. Very nice. I still like that. I still like that. Anytime we That's a pretty packed sky. All of yes. that is spelled out in the show notes. All of it is spelled out. So if you heard something that might have piqued your interest just go look at it over there. All right, Heather, I think that brings us to the end of the show, doesn't it? I think so. Wow, big, big show. All right, everyone. Yes. Well, thank you for joining us, and thanks to our chat room for joining us this week over at jblive.tv this Tuesday evening. Heather, thank you for the great show. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week's episode of SciBite. Don't forget, SciBite is fresh every Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and you can subscribe. We'll have links in the show notes, and then you get SciBite automatically every single week. All right, everyone. We'll see you right back here next week.